inviting me, don't let me forget my phone or my watch or my computer. Somebody uh, remind me. Um, and someone save some pizza for me. I, I'm very happy to be here. It's always an honor to be invited to uh, any university, and I've wanted to come here for a while. Uh, you might be asking yourself, why is there a Rorschach test picture up on the screen? And it's because this is actually a psychological evaluation for you all. Um, sorry, these are bad news. No, the, the, this is, uh, well, what's the point of a Rorschach test? The point of a Rorschach test is that there's this massive amount of visual information or this random amount of visual information on a, on a screen or a page, and then you tell someone what you see. And so the question isn't what the picture really is of, it's what you perceive it being. That's, it tells you more about yourself than about what you're looking at. And that's also, I just realized I forgot my talk. It's fine, I can, I've memorized the first part. Uh, that's also what happens, that's by the way a first. I blame the stresses of parenting. This is a first uh, for me. Now, it, it, why is this uh, pertinent to the question of, um, the question of Muslims and Islam, especially Muslims and Islam as perceived in the West by people in the United States, by people in the West? Because uh, the population of the Muslim world, the Muslim population of the world is vast. I say there's about 1.5 billion Muslims in the world. 1.5 billion Muslims in the world. And there's astounding diversity amongst these 1.5 billion. When people talk about Islam and Muslims, they often just think of the Middle East, but not that many Muslims live in the Middle East. Only about 330 million or so live in the Middle East. Uh, the vast majority of the world's Muslims live in South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Southeast Asia. So people think, let's say, Pakistan. Pakistan is a Muslim country in South Asia. Population is about 200 million or so, 190 million. But the population of, so the Muslim population of India, Muslims are about 15, 14% of the population in India, is about 200 million Muslims. So there are about as many Muslims in India as there are people in Pakistan. So when we think of what the Muslim world is, where do Muslims live? We think about the Middle East. We don't think about South Asia and Southeast Asia, where the, the largest Muslim countries in terms of population are in Southeast Asia. Indonesia is the largest Muslim population in the world. And we don't think of India as being a country with a Muslim population so large, it's equal to the actual entire population of Pakistan, a very Muslim country. So anytime we're thinking about this enormous mass of humanity, this incredibly diverse mass of humanity, right? Muslims live everywhere from Lancaster, Pennsylvania to Cape Town, South Africa, from, south, from uh, Java to Russia, from Argentina to Japan. Right? And when we think about this incredibly diverse, massive number of people, we are necessarily going to be generalizing. And the picture that we imagine, the images we conjure up in our mind are going to be more about what we see than about this unencompassable mass of data. So anytime a human being is confronted with, a tr with so much information that they can't possibly encompass it, they will always draw on their own stereotypes. They'll always draw on biases. They'll always draw on, draw on preconceptions. And so the, when we talk about Islam, when we talk about the Muslim world, we're not really talking about those things when we talk about here in the United States. We're talking about ourselves. This is a Rorschach test that tells us about ourselves. So what does, when we talk about the Muslim world, when we talk about Islam, what kind, of, uh, what kind of thing are we discovering about our own society? What kind of thing are we discovering about Western civilization? What kind of thing are we discovering about the United States? Well, one of the main roles that the religion of Islam and Muslims have played in Western civilization is the role of the other, the role of the other. Now what is the, how does, how does the other, what role does the other play in how we understand ourselves? The other is the thing that we're not. This is a process called negative integration, negative integration. Negative integration is when you define yourself by pointing to someone else or something else and saying this thing is, you know, ABC, I'm not ABC. I'm X, Y, Z, for example. So especially if, let's say you have a group of people who maybe don't have that much in common with each other, 
it's very handy for them to be some for there to be some other that they can all point to and say they're not us they have the things we don't like and we are the things that we do like we're we, we're positive they're negative we're good they're bad so in this the history of western civilization islam as a religion muslims as a population have always played this role for the west which is in, which is historically incredibly diverse linguistically culturally religiously but islam helps to provide that other against which the West sees itself as a unified whole. But especially in the case of Islam-West relations, this is the case in a lot of uh, instances of negative integration or talking about the other, but especially in the case of talking about Islam and Muslims when you're in the West. Uh, Islam and Muslims become the screen on which we project our own anxieties. Islam and Muslims become the screen on which we project our own anxieties, our own internal contradictions, our own hypocrisies. So I'm going to talk today a, a few examples of this. I'm going to talk about a few of the ways in which the way that we think about Muslims and Islam here in the United States really reveals more about us and reveals our anxieties, our inconsistencies, our internal contradictions. And in particular, one that comes up over and over again is our inability to deal with real difference. I want you to think about it. A lot of times people talk about America as a diverse country, as a country of, uh, of, of immigrants, in which there's no official language. Of course, this is all quite contested today. But actually, if you think about it, the United States and Western Europe are very bad at dealing with real profound internal difference. A de a de a dealing with real, profound, internal, moral disagreement. And you just have to look at the way, for example, that Western European countries dealt with religious minorities over the course of a few centuries, and particularly the 20th century. It's very hard for Western culture to deal with real internal difference, especially religious and cultural difference. Okay. Um, one of the things we see is that the way that mo people here in the United States and the West in general perceive Islam and Muslims is functions to keep minorities in their place and functions to deny minorities or the other the same rights that the majority in the West has. The same rights to freedom of expression, the same right to freedom of religious practice, the same rights to uh, religious belief. And I'll just take the example of freedom of speech first. Uh, one of the tropes you find in discussions about freedom of speech globally, and this will come up every couple of years, even every couple of months, you'll always have the same thing, which is uh, the fact that Muslims and Islam just don't respect freedom of speech. Uh, Muslims just, you'll, you'll see you know, sometimes newspaper articles or, or op-eds saying, no, why don't Muslims understand? Why don't they just understand the importance of freedom of speech? Why aren't they like us? And of course, probably the most famous and tragic example of this is the uh, Charlie Hebdo uh, killings in 2000, 2015. So at the beginning of 2015, uh, a group of terrorists go into the Charlie Hebdo office of this, uh, this uh, satirical publication and they, they kill the, the, uh, much of the staff. Right? And uh, in the days after that, there's this tremendous demonstration of Western civilizational unity uh, for the freedom of speech and against those Muslims who just don't understand why freedom of speech is so important. So you have these images of people, crowds of, of young French people getting together and standing and holding up pens and saying, Je suis Charlie. Now, uh, what we didn't see, in fact, actually, American newspapers, Americans being generally, I think, a bit more aware of consistency on freedom of speech issues than Western Europeans, that what you didn't see is the fact that in the days, two, just two days after the Charlie Hebdo attack, a French comedian, his picture of him here, uh, of him here Dieu, Dele, Dieu Donne un Bala Bala, who had a comic routine where he would sort of poke fun at the French majority from the perspective of, of a, a religious and racial minority in France. He was banned from performing his comic routine because, as the court said in France, there is uh, the reality of and gravity of the risk of trouble to public order. So this French administrative court said, this guy's comic routine is, poses a real threat to public order. 
because some of his jokes were seen as uh, anti-Semitic, some of his jokes were seen as, uh, as hate speech. Now you have to ask yourself the question, if public order is so important to French courts, and if the protection of public order is something that would justify restricting somebody's speech, why didn't the French government restrict what had already been demonstrated to be a real threat to public order, namely the Islamophobic cartoons published in Charlie Hebdo? For years, Charlie Hebdo had been publishing images of the Prophet Muhammad that were considered offensive to Muslims. And in fact, this attack in 2015 was not the first attack on the cartoon, on the, on the newspaper. So on one hand, you have a French court saying, this minority comedian cannot speak because it presents a threat to public order. But when it comes to restricting a voice from the Christian or non-Muslim majority in the country, oh, any restriction on that would be a violation of freedom of speech, and freedom of speech is sacrosanct, je suis Charlie. So this is an example of, uh, of this, um, I mean, I think it's hypocrisy. Where Muslims are criticized for not getting it, not understanding freedom of speech, while the sort of self-righteous expression of the majority actually conceals or veils that majority's refusal to give the minority the same rights and freedom of speech that, that they have. And the United States, thank God, has uh, a much stronger regime of freedom of speech than Western European countries. And it's, it's quite rare that you'll see uh, the government in the United States restrict anyone's freedom of speech, except in the sort of normal manner of time, place, and normal ways of time, place, and manner, and having people behind barricades and things like that. But you do see it on the part of American corporations and, and universities and private institutions that can restrict expression. And uh, if you remember back in 2012, actually it was the I think it was the September 11th, 2012, there was, this, uh, there was this trailer of a movie that was released on YouTube. The movie was never actually made. The, it was supposed to be called The Innocence of Muslims. And it was a really low budget trailer about a movie about the Prophet Muhammad. Now, I wrote an entire book on the Prophet Muhammad, so I read almost everything nasty that Western civilization and Christians have said about the Prophet Muhammad. This was the nastiest thing I'd ever seen. I mean, they came up with new nasty ways to insult Muslims and insult the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, and remember, there were all these protests in different parts of the Muslim world about this movie. And um, the United States government quietly tried to talk with YouTube to maybe get them to take this down. And in fact, they did in, I think, Pakistan and Afghanistan. But in general, YouTube refused. They said, this is freedom of speech. Now, just a month earlier in 2012, just a month before that, a Jewish publication called Jewish Press had published an article very proudly announcing that YouTube had agreed to take down hundreds of anti-Semitic videos. Hundreds of anti-Semitic videos. And if you look at YouTube's um, hate speech policy, which you can find on their on their webpage, it's very simple. It says, we do not allow any uh, expression that is, expresses hatred towards um, any religious, ethnic, sexual minority, et cetera, et cetera, any, any of the, these protected groups, or these classes. So when it came to anti-Semitic videos, they violated YouTube's hate speech policy, and they were taken down. When it came to this video, which was, in my opinion, the most insulting thing ever produced by a human being about the Prophet Muhammad, this did not violate uh, YouTube's hate speech policy. And in fact, they made, a, they made a, uh, a point of keeping this video up, even though it very clearly uh, insulted many, many millions of Muslims around the world and led to uh, threats to public order. Okay. So that's freedom of speech. What about another issue that comes up all the time when we talk about Islam and Muslims, which is Islam and women, or women's issues, oppression of women? And here again, um, by the way, I, I'm in no way suggesting that I agree with the free speech rules in Muslim countries, or I think that they're all good. There's uh, um, many problems with, in, in many Muslim countries. But I'm specifically talking about 
our perception here in the United States and what it tells us about ourselves. Same thing with uh, issues of, of uh, treatment of women in the Muslim world. We can sit around all day and, and come with very valid criticisms of the way that Muslim women are treated in various Muslim countries. But my point is, we can sit around all day and talk about the treatment of women globally as a human problem. Not as a Muslim problem, it's a human problem. What we see with the discourse of Islam and women in the West, when we talk about Islam and women, when you see this written about in the newspaper, or when, for example, uh, Donald Trump gets convinced that we need to increase the number of troops in Afghanistan because his national security advisor shows him a picture of women in 1970 in uh, Kabul walking in miniskirts. And he's so inspired by this that he thinks we have to go and send more uh, troops to uh, Afghanistan. If you haven't read this story, you can read it, just Google it, you'll know what I'm talking about. Okay? So the fact that uh, the notion of Muslim women being oppressed plays such a role in the way that we think about how our country should interact with the Muslim world, potentially even militarily interact with them. What we see historically in the West is that Islam and Muslims serves as a vehicle for expressing our anxieties about sexuality and outsourcing our patriarchy. I love this phrase, the notion of outsourcing patriarchy. We absolve ourselves of our own crimes against women, of our own mistreatment of women, of our own sexism, by making it always other people. It's always brown people. It's always Muslims who mistreat women. Think about this. How often do you read about violence against women in the United States? How often do you hear about uh, a, a, someone, a woman being killed by her partner, and this is talked about a, a vi violence against women? No, it's always a crime. It's always this couple. It's an incident. It's a particular. When other people, when brown people over there do things, it's because of their religion. It's because of their misogynist culture, especially Muslims. And this is a... Uh, I mean, I find this absolutely fascinating, okay? This was last summer, so summer of 2016. Uh, tragically, a Pakistani social media star, is that a thing? Can you be a social media star? Okay, I, I don't know if I'm making that up. So I guess she did uh, Snapchats or something, or videos. I don't really understand how these things work. So this was, her name was uh, Kundil Baloch, or that was her screen name. And she was tragically and wrongly killed by her brother, who disapproved of her on-screen performances. Now, when she was killed, there was a standalone article in The Economist about her. And this is not unusual. I mean, if there is something, uh, if, if there's a, 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 you can always find examples in the media about honor killings in the Muslim world. Now, what no one talked about, when this happened, I immediately checked it out. I found, in that same month in India, three dowry killings had occurred. You might say to yourself, gee, Professor Brown, what's a dowry killing? Most of you probably don't know what a dowry killing is, but you all know what an honor killing is. Dowry killings are, uh, these occur in India and in the, amongst the Hindu majority, right? It's an instance in which a wife is killed by sometimes her husband, sometimes her husband's family for either bringing an insufficiently large dowry into the family, but really it's just about something, she's, she's not being a proper wife in some way or another. Now, I have a PhD. I got my PhD in 2006. I'm a pretty educated guy. I don't know anything about sports, but other things I know a lot about. I did not even know dowry killings existed until I went to India in 2012. I didn't even know they existed. Okay, according to UN, the UN, uh, a UN report in 2012, in 2009, they were eight, there were 8,300 dowry killings in India. And that's pretty, you see it's pretty standard. You have around 5,000 a year dowry killings in India. This is equal to UN estimates at the number of honor killings, which of course are always done by Muslims, Globally. But do we talk about that? No, we don't talk about that. Because Muslims are the people who have problems with women. We don't talk about violence against women as a global problem. We don't talk about 
Femicide, femicide is violence or killing women because they're women. We don't talk about that as a global problem, which exists in the United States as it exists elsewhere. So by making Muslims the villains when it comes to the treatment of women, we absolve ourselves and others of this crime. We put the focus on the other, in this in case, uh, Muslims. Of course, there's the issue of Islam and violence, Islam and terrorism. This is just some statistics based on uh, Peter Bergen, the sort of CNN terrorist, uh, terrorism analyst, uh, and also a scholar named Charles Kurzman at UNC, his book, Missing Martyrs. Based on their estimates at the number of Muslim terrorists in the world, and taking the lowest estimate of the Muslim population globally, what percentage of Muslims in the world are terrorists? And this is a really broad definition of terrorism. This is basically any Muslim who's got a gun and shooting at somebody or trying to blow something up. 0.006%, statistically insignificant. And when you look at Muslims in America, what percentage of the Muslim American population has even been arrested for a terrorism-related crime? Forget if they're guilty or not, even been arrested 0.0007%. I wish it were 0.007, then I could memorize it, remember it better because of 007, but it's 0.0007%. This is statistically insignificant. But look how much anxiety, look how much anxiety people feel over Muslims in America as terrorists. In fact, statistically speaking, if you want to be safe, in the United States, you should follow around a Muslim because Muslims are less likely to engage in acts of violent crime than just a random American male. And by the way, um, this is very controversial to say, but I care a lot about veterans because my, my sister's a veteran. The problems that American veterans have in terms of violent crime is a real issue because they don't have sufficient care. They don't have sufficient medical care. They don't have sufficient psych psychiatric care after they come back from fighting abroad. If you look at the percentage of Iraq and Afghan war veterans who've interacted with the justice system in some way because of violent crime, it's about 2.6%. So American Muslims, 0.0007%, 0.0007%. But we would never, we would never think of treating veterans as a target population. As a, as a security concern. We think of them as heroes, right? We thank them for their service and then don't give them the care they need. But when it comes to Muslims who are much less statistically likely to be involved in, 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 in violent crimes, then suddenly Muslims become this villain that ha we need to throw out all sorts of rights. We need to deprive people of their right to freedom of speech. We need to deprive people of their right to freedom of religion. We need to put right, deprive people of their right to express their political beliefs. We need to deprive Muslims in America of all these rights before um, we, we actually think about what kind of danger they really pose. I mean, and, and, and what I find fascinating is, and sometimes I wonder if ISIS chose mass shootings as a kind of sick joke to the American population. Uh, because when you look at, let's say, the Orlando nightclub shooting, which was done by, this, by a Muslim, um, or the San Bernardino, Bernardino killing, also uh, seems to be inspired by ISIS, uh, there are just two mass shootings amongst all these other big mass shootings. You know, the Orlando is number one in terms of per, the number of people killed. Right after it is Sandy Hook. Right after that is, I think, um, uh, Virginia Tech shooting. But, uh, you know, our Congress won't take away any rights to bear arms. They won't pass any laws to restrict these things. But our own president campaigned on the depriving Muslims of rights. And people in America don't have a problem, or a lot of them don't have a problem, with depriving Muslims of their civil rights in this country. Okay. 
And finally, well, almost finally, uh, Sharia, which is, of course, always a hot topic. What is a Sharia? Some people don't know. Sometimes Sharia gets translated as, as Islamic law. That's a pretty good translation. Sharia is the idea of God's law. Uh, Sharia is kind of like uh, American law in the sense that there's no book of American law. You can't go into the library and find, you know, oh, give me the book of American law. Oh, American law is a, a field of law. And every state, you know, Pennsylvania has law of property, and Pennsylvania, Maryland has family law, and all these other things. It, in its particulars, uh, it might differ, but the, I, there's this overall idea of God's law, which is derived from the Quran, from the precedence of the Prophet Muhammad, and from Muslim legal reasoning. The Sharia is the ultimate 